From Mary Shelley's Frankenstein to the Lucas and Roddenberry franchises, the Martian Chronicles, and beyond. Science fiction is undeniably a part of our culture. But what exactly is science fiction? And how do you write a science fiction novel? This series will attempt to answer those questions. Okay, here we are. The first Welcome, in the guys. studio of him. <laughs> Virtual studio. Okay, well, I'm really excited because now now it's fun time and you know, we're 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 halfway between now and the weekend, so there's still a lot of work to do. And you know, I think it's great that we're taking a pause, you know, to focus on something so important like building a science fiction novel and it starts today, right? I'll give you one more than you know, right? Wait, wait, guys, time out. I need to know. Are you ready to go on this journey? Ooh. <laughs> the red pill or the blue <laughs> pill? Welcome to the matrix. <laughs> Let's see how deep the rabbit hole goes. Yes! Yeah. <laughs> yes! That is my business partner. So proud. <laughs> <laughs> well, remember, you can't climb back out once you've gone in, right? <laughs> Let's do it. Speaking of the Matrix, guys, are you guys what what can you say about the Matrix? I mean, was it was it something that you you sunk your teeth into and got involved with a in in almost like a, a um a cult mentality type of thing? Did you really get into it or were you passively just watching it and yeah, it was a good it was a good flick. Oh, I loved it. I was obsessed with it. Matrix Reloaded is still my number 3 favorite movie of all time. So <laughs> I just, I loved how cool it was, how cerebral it was, how it blew people's minds out of the water. Um, you know, they invented new filming technology to do the bullet time. Like, they just, they went epic. They're like, let's make something that's ever made before, right? And they did it. And that's amazing. So, yeah, you, I, I really liked it. I don't think I was maybe as like, not cults, definitely, but I, I loved it. I've definitely watched um, The Matrix pro probably close to 20 times. So the first one and then the second and third, not, a, not as many, but repeatedly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the, the Matrix, you guys, let's have a little bit of a poll or a guess here between the three of us. When, when do you think that The Matrix came out? If, if you were, I'm, I'm consulting the Google Oracle right now as we're talking to you. <laughs> okay. Next year, in 2003 and 2004. <laughs> okay, so we got we got the residential expert here. Yes. No, um, no. we had to wait four agonizing years to find out. I, I, was, you know, oh man, so that, this was uh, this was college years, right? This is university, full on, like you know, master's yeah. level years, right? You know, right into the thick of things. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. This is when we were primed to be indoctrined with big ideas, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's great, and and then it has a little like you know soft spot in my heart because when I first met Adam, right, he'd mm. come in and my maiden name is Smith, right, so he'd come in and call me Agent Smith, right. The he'd be like, "Hey, Agent." Yeah. <laughs> so uh, so yeah. that was my nickname for the longest time for like years when we were working together. He'd call me Agent, and so I was like, "Ah, <laughs> nerd reference." <laughs> I had a few people do the, you know, the, I don't know what, how you describe the voice, but Anderson, you know, sort of thing. Right. So there's, you know, that type of thing. Right. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's really interesting. And then, so the, the Y2K was something that was, um, you know, kind of on the minds of everybody prior to that rollover of the two yeah, triple zero. Right. right. Yeah. It was going to be back to the stone ages and then and maybe one light bulb flickered and that was it. <laughs> Right. I know, really, like, you know, all the machines are going to just, like, collapse, right? That was that was a really interesting thing. So mm -hmm. fear fear has a has a big part to play in the minds of culture. And, you know, speaking of that, when we when we leverage on the fear levers within our psychology, there's mm -hmm. there's um, uh, a lot of potential good as well as harm that, that can happen out of, out of these novels. So um, 
I also look at a responsibility that an author has. And, and I think to myself, you know, ultimately at the core of, of this book, on this, this collaborative exercise in authorship that we're going to be working on, um, I'd like to spend a little bit of time today talking about the main thrusts of the theme. Right. This is this is um, what what are the things that that you want to draw out on a on a thematic um, uh, uh, perspective? Well, I think it's um, perfect that you brought up the Matrix. And, you know, maybe this is on purpose, but that, that was that was kind of maybe part of the inspiration for our, our kind of idea. Right. We 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 deal in this realm of business and engagement and people, team building, and how humans work together and, and that kind of thing. And we kind of, if we extrapolate into the future, we say, well, what if business was done in like a, like an oasis environment, like Ready Player One or like the Matrix? And that's kind of where you did business and where you interacted. And it was a super virtual cerebral world. But then what would, what would happen to human connection? Um, and how would that look like? And, um, you know, what would a transformation in that realm look like? Um, just, did I capture yeah. that, Caitlin? Oh, perfectly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it, and it, so this is where it's really interesting. And the cool thing you can do with sci-fi is that, like, like slivers of truth or pivotal moments. And we're going to take this, um, this crisis that we're all going through as kind of like the pivotal moment in history that started this snowball effect to where our story takes place right and so we're going to project like these the truth that we're living right now is we're on the pivotal moment and that's where this future has come from so it's going to be so interesting um how it changes you know, economy, how it changes, how, how we interact with each other, with our homes, with our families, at business and everything. And it really is that journey of a personal connection that has been transformed through digital, I guess, reach and mm-hmm. mechanism. Okay. So something that doesn't have to show up in the, um, in, in the novel at all, but I want to get your guys' take on, on, a, on something called transhumanism. And so transhumanism is is this merger between um, between humans and moving into um, integration, a complete singularity with 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 technology. So I do see the overlap, but I'm curious about are you guys okay? We've got okay. He's dialing in there. Yeah, it's like I can read your mind. <laughs> yeah. Is this what yeah. You're- like this kind of like we're now merging ourselves it, funny enough like the very first kind of concept we talked about was getting chipped in and yes. this this is funny because then because like you know the whole elon musk concept came out of actually chipping people in and like and then there's this conspiracy of you know vaccines chipping people and all this stuff going on so i mean conspiracy or not like people have thought about it uh, yeah. yeah. How do you detach from what we're thinking? And does it in does is there an undercurrent of 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 deterministic outcomes that happen just from our our consciousness thinking about it, right? Like our social mm-hmm. cultural consciousness actually moving in the, that direction. Um, yeah. You know, transhuman. You know, that's interesting concept, right? Because you know, you could say, you know, maybe it is an inevitable that us as an individual consciousness um, are kind of destined or, or are like designed to try and connect with each other and try and create this larger consciousness or whatever you want to call it, right? So is this merging with technology, is it really inevitable? Are we kind of like pre-programmed to connect with each other to the point that we will forever try and connect more and more and more and more and more? Um, till the end of time, whatever that looks like. Yeah. You know, I want to, I want to bring up a concept that um, I don't know if you guys know, but I, I have for probably too many years been working on a, a novel called Will Freeman. 
Did I tell you about that novel? No. No. Oh. Well, it's about artificial intelligence, oddly enough. Mm. <laughs> and then philosophical, obviously, you can see the, the connection there. Um, but Will Freeman was the name of the uh, of, of of the novel, and I I fought against trying to move this into a science fiction uh, futurity. I was I was trying to fight against that, um, and I don't know entirely why. Whether it was a bias or not, I just I didn't I didn't want it to have the label of science fiction for some particular reason. And again, I can't really articulate why. Um, I think probably because I didn't have a tremendous amount of um, direct experience or uh, influences in the science fiction genre, right? Okay. I spend a lot of my time in in, in historical nonfiction, right? And so um, I, I, anyways, I, I, I wanted to do something that was more geared towards that sort of approach. But anyways, the premise of the book is such that we have this narrative and culture uh, that artificial intelligence is bad and the boogeyman's going to come and get you. And we got to be careful that, that artificial intelligence isn't going to be one of those existential threats that completely take over the world and, you know, this type of thing. And so one of the things that an author can do is they can take a dominant narrative and a sentiment that trans that goes across society and show an alternative to it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the premise of the book was that humanity had an expiration date, right? And I, I guess arbitrarily picked uh, 2062. And what happens is that if, if you can imagine for a minute, we knew 100% that there was no biological uh, life on, 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 the, on the planet or humanity, sapiens, was actually going to just gone for sure by 2062, right? Okay. So the premise is to say, all right, well, shit, what do we do? How do we now capture humanity in a, uh, in, in a semi-quasi-biological, inventive, uh, artificial intelligence? How do we, what, what do we put into this thing? Hmm. You know what I'm saying? And that was, yeah. that was, that was the idea. And, and instantly it turns the sentiment around to, you know, from, from foe to friend, right? Because this is this is our entire lineage of moving culture forward is that there is no other choice. Mm. We either have something that represents humanity into the future, right? Or yeah. we have nothing. And so the choice is like, what do you put in this entity? What do you put in it, you know, to represent humanity? And mm. uh that was a whole different approach to how to um you know, program, so to speak, um, and, and artificial intelligence. Interesting. You know, this, this really makes me think of, you know, if you take a business as an entity, right? You're talking about a programming, a simulation or an AI, but when you're programming a business, like kind of a similar concept, like what parts of humanity do you want in there? Right? Like, what is your legacy? What is your imprint on the world? If, if your business were to cease to exist tomorrow, what would the world lose? Right? That's a kind of powerful question, right? Um, so that's very good, Adam. Because yeah. you know, you ask that question in a way. I was reflecting on it when I was doing some writing earlier this week, mm -hmm. and there's sequences as we go through life, right? You know, we talk about that matrix time period when. You know, we're roughly all, you know, post-college, like emerging into the workforce and all this kind of thing, right? Um, mm. the, the internet was really just coming out in, in a big way. I think, you know, we can look up when Google started. We all remember a world prior to Google. My kids mm -hmm. don't. Right. Yeah. Yeah, right? like social media, all those things, right? Um yeah. So I guess I guess the point was is that if you if you look at that and you and you kind of think about what what is the what's the world going to be like in in 500 years? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not even trying to extrapolate based off of Moore's law that you know technology is doubling and all this kind of thing. I I'm not I don't have to do that. But what I am saying is that what is what is what happens to our our biological evolution? Um, and not so much in 500 years, 500,000 years, 
or five million years, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> so you, evolution is all about time, right? And and so it's like, what does the, what is a human species if it's even alive? What would it possibly even look like in five million years? Yeah, yeah, that's so interesting, right? Because I mean we're evolving at such a slow rate, but we're experimenting with things that are accelerating that, right? When we talk about the stem cell research, when we talk about messing with our our genomes and adjusting these kind of things, and you talk about creating a baby exactly the way you want it, (laughs) your designer baby, right? Like these are concepts and the science is already there to back them up that we are just literally not doing out of ethical choice, but have the capability to do so at one point if we push through those those ethical barriers and say that we're going to do these things we're going to take leaps and bounds and maybe not the direction that nature would have originally taken us so the the possibilities are infinite under that one yeah well is it um was it arthur c clark said that any technology sufficiently advanced um, from your reference point would seem like magic <laughs> Right. You know, you know, there's all sorts of amazing stories in that come out of that, right? You don't even have to explain it. You just say it's future. It's too advanced. Um, you know, I always, I always, this is one thing that I always thought I would like, you know, it'd be funny evolve, but obviously we're going to get to autonomous cars before this is a realization, but like being able to like chameleons have one eye down and one eye up. <laughs> Like the road while people are texting. <laughs> oh, that's great, Kate. That is so great. That is so amazing. Oh, I love that. That's like a little applause. That is so funny. Right. Well, that ability would be helpful. Can you imagine? So, can you imagine? You imagine you're on a date with a woman, right? And you're looking. You're at a restaurant. This is all, you know, see before COVID, right? I'm sitting there and I'm, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to do, I'm trying to do my, like, I'm putting, trying to get my game on. Right. I'm trying to really just, you know, you know, get, give her the eyes or whatever else. And, and, and she's got one eye on me, one eyeball at me and one down on her phone in her lap. And I'm just like, fuck, I can't, I can't, get the it. I, can't get it. I can't do it. I can't do it. But, but the bonus, what happened about it is that, you know what, the sleazy guy, right, he can have one guy, one eye up and one eye down. He's like, no, I'm not looking at your cleavage at all. Nothing. Not, not one thing, right? <laughs> so many applications to that evolution, right? I, I have a feeling autonomous cars will come in first before we get to the evolution of being able to disjointedly look and process information. <laughs> You know, speaking of, you know, manipulating your your biology, one of the things Caitlin talk, I talked about as like a plot point in this world where you're plugged in like this is like, well, if you were plugged in and you had chips, then you could control like instant REM sleep. So maybe you only have to sleep three hours a night and it's like good sleep. So it's more like an on off switch than a bedtime. And then what would that do to now all of a sudden, you're, you know, you're working 20, you're awake 21 hours a day instead of you know, 18 or whatever, like, what does that look like? Yeah. Um, so, um, so then you're so like, yeah. you're not a regular work schedule. Cause it's not like I have to work, eat, sleep schedule anymore. It's mm-hmm. like, I've got to schedule my day and this hour might be work. This hour might be personal. This hour might be a sleep hour. This hour might be right. And so that's exactly what we talked about is, is kind of like, what if we had that ability to, you know, plug in, chip in, and you can say, okay, schedule sleep. And it's scheduled and it's done and it's fully rejuvenated, right? And so you wake up and you're you're great. Like versus I spend, you know, two hours last night trying to sleep yeah. before I actually got there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I know I think that's that's a that's a really great idea. And I've I, I'm I've actually caught myself um realizing that I'm really fortunate not to have to battle with sleep so much. There's, there's a lot of people that, that, that have, uh, insomnia, uh, that have to take medication that really Mm -hmm. battle with sleepless nights. Uh, I mean, sure. There's been instances where I kind of keep up and I, you know, but I, I have a, a regular time that I go to bed. Yeah. Um, I look at, um, uh, there's a routine and a ritual. My wife and I throw uh, an audio book on, so it's like this background noise that's going on. 
Nice. Um, yeah, I really should put, um, you know, something um, uh, and, and cease the screen time. I think it's up to two hours prior to actually going to bed, right? Yeah. The blue light and stuff like that. Um, but it, the sleep, sleep is one of the foundational uh, um, you know, requirements. Now, changing the sleep pattern, the biology of the sleep pattern is very interesting. Um, I don't know, if, did you guys know that, that, that dolphins, you know, they, they swim half asleep. They see the dolphin going like this. It's like sleeping, it, but mm -hmm. it still functions. It still, you know, can somewhat react. It's just like, like half conscious kind of thing. <laughs> That's right. my kid's story. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, exactly. Before we get our coffee, that's exactly way, the way I am. <laughs> well, and then, you know, then we kind of threw in this wrench of like cheating. So if you could control your sleep and, and you could like maybe make that efficient and optimal and, and then like, what if you just decided to push it? Like people will always try and push the limits, right? So we thought like maybe that is the catalyst for our journey is this character um, starts turning off the sleep and goes without sleeping. And that in turn evokes um, essentially a, a nervous breakdown of sorts, right? Yeah, like Which, a stress heart attack of some sort or something. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and in the system of control where you can control all these things, then we imagined like, okay, maybe you have a healthcare system that says, hey, you can control all this stuff. If you're not listening, you're not like behaving in these things, then you don't get health insurance that's like this world we imagine so now he's skipping his sleep now he has a nervous breakdown now he's forced to then you know go through a series of steps that he wouldn't normally do um because of this the system and then you know we thought maybe that's the catalyst for how this character is kind of forced into a scenario that his regular would experience <laughs> wouldn't otherwise have so, okay, you guys ready for philosophical yeah. insight here now? Oh yes. This Ooh, is this is yes. one of the things Later. that I'm going to throw your way. And as authors, you guys are the lead authors on this. And what you decide to do with this hot mm. potato is up to you. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> there's a an articulated concept about Christian hell. Okay. And okay. Christian okay. hell is essentially outcast from the group, the in group, out group. Okay. So if you imagine yourself not part of your social group, if you imagine yourself ousted from your family and your ties and everything out on your own, this is the most um, horrific manifestation of uh, the fall, basically. This is the idea that you're now separated from society. And mm -hmm. we live in this weird dichotomy where we're, we, we want to be around people, but we want our alone time. But there's a huge comfort in having these these connections, but we still want to have some, you know, sort of thing, right? That individuality, um, you know, coupled with you sociality. So that's the concept of hell from that sort of standpoint. And I think about the the viral nature um, of 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 a religion and how it just exploded. Christianity just exploded, and um, and, and and I'm trying to bring some parallels to this this new uh, electronic uh, explosion, right? So Adam's painting a picture of, um, you know, we can actually oust people from this, you know, from from this social norm if you don't follow these particular rules. Because, like, if you don't look after yourself, sleep wise, if you don't, you know, do the things that you're supposed to do, you're going to be pushed out. And experience some type of social hell. Mm. Yeah. Because the question yeah. is: Go Does ahead. this manifest as a religion version 2.0? Ah, mm. ooh, I like that. Yeah. That's super interesting. We I don't. I don't think we considered that as a religion piece, but super interesting. We did consider having like the the group, like the almost the rebels, right? Who were unplugged, if you will, that like lived in a way that we would think is archaic, almost to the point where people don't even recognize them as, you know, the same anymore, right? The way they're living. But just to back it up a little bit, I, I love that sort of like parallel of like ousted in the, in the hell concept. 
that's interesting. One of the concepts of, of where he's going to learn, you know, where he's going to go through a transformation. Oh, Adam got through a wormhole again. Ah, we're going to have to clear these wormholes. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Connecting wormhole. Okay. <laughs> so one of the things, like two things I want to get to here, because there's really an interesting point is that what we imagined is that um, the this crisis that we're going through in the pandemic actually is the first of many snowballing pandemics. And what it causes the world to do is come together and unite in health and say, our health resources are so limited and they're so strapped that if you guys don't do these things to take care of yourselves, and if we give you prescriptions and you don't follow them, and if you, if we say you need this surgery and you don't do it there, you're out, you don't get covered because we can't handle it. Right. And so that's where it all stems from that. It, that comes into this whole healthcare system, which isn't hard to imagine, right? Yeah. Our, our healthcare systems right now are so strapped for resources. People who they could save are being saved. Yeah. Right. And we're choosing. And, and and then, and yeah. And then countries, you know, certain countries are, you know, they're, the problems are just exponentially bigger. Um, I actually heard Alberta was on a, a, a per capita or no, uh, you know, per person basis was right up there in terms of infection rates with India. And that's damn scary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. Well, really is. I, I think this plays nicely. So this idea of hell and it becoming religious, right? You know, there's this you know, story. If, if you have, uh, I don't know, a group of people that, I don't know, move to a, like uh, a different planet, first people to land on, on a different planet that's habitable, right? A lot will die in the beginning because you're just learning to interact interact with the wildlife and the disease there and all that kind of stuff. So eventually you're going to learn, you know, don't go near the water because there's, you know, something in the water that's going to eat you. Right. And then it becomes really more of a practical survival tactic. And then a generation goes by and that's taught. And then all of a sudden it becomes, we don't go to the water because the water is, you know, God said we shouldn't go to the water. And then within a couple of generations, it's a religious part of your beliefs when it stemmed from something entirely practical, um, which is what happens, you know, historically. So this idea that, okay, now we're plugged in and, you know, we had this notion of, well, there's got to be fringe members of society that are totally against it, right? The anti-vaxxers or the, you know, the flat earthers or whatever. And (laughs) how desperate would you be if you got knocked out for cheating because you made these choices, right? So this, this is kind of what we want to like capture this desperation. This character's like, got to get in there. So he's going to, you know, be a little bit impulsive and like do these things. And then some exterior external forces are going to cause just, just this crazy trip, which is going to catalyze this transformation that we were imagining. Yeah. So. That's great. That's really great. When is the, t- when, the, when are you guys imagining the timeline uh, like taking place for this, um, for the series? Uh, is it is a couple hundred years in the future? So, so I, th- I think it's, yeah, I think we're at 20, 23, 60, 400. Yeah. We're, we haven't totally sorted out the timeline. We're figuring that out, counting it back. But what one of the things that changes with all this technological advance thing in with pushing through some of these barriers of, of the technology that exists that we're not utilizing right now in history, what happens is lifespans increase to gradually over to almost 200 years. Oh, is a typical okay. life. Yeah. Okay. So now, now everything changes. So like we've seen this already in our generation, like, I don't know about you guys, but my parents had kids in their twenties. Most of my friends had kids in their thirties. If your lifespan goes to 200, when are you having kids? Right. So now everything stretches out, right? The perspective is different. The world's different that way. You can go ahead and do things uh, and then still turn around and have a family without any pressure. Right. So there's going to be this concept of an elongated lifespan as well. Wow. Very interesting. Very interesting. Okay. You know, what does that do? You know, if you look at, uh, you know, I'd say someone in their eighties, let's say right now, how they would 
view something like social media or this type of thing, right? Like there's only so much change a human can handle in their, in their lifetime. So if that's extended, like what happens, right? Do you end up with these like kind of generational pockets that are independent or do people kind of come together in a more unified way? Like, I don't, you know, I haven't really explored that too much, but like what, what would, what would happen? You know? Yeah. Guys, look, I want to tell you something, um, a, a question. I mean, it's, it's a, basically an executive question between the three of us. Um, and so you see that there's there's three spots here on the on the video. Um, if Adam moved over a little bit, we could actually put someone else in there, right? Yeah. <laughs> Not, but, but what I'm curious about <laughs> is <laughs> we brought up a really interesting question, and I think it would be really great to push Adam either to the right or the left and put – um, you know, that that evolutionary biologist right in there and say, look, we're you know, we're having some fun here on this show. And mm -hmm. and we have this idea of, of what the plausibility of that would be in a timeline of whatever. What what would be realistic in terms of of this type of thing? Yeah. Um, I think that would be really interesting. Yeah, that was the whole idea. Right. Hopefully we can you know, throw this against uh, an audience and people way smarter than us and say, no, that's totally stupid. It would never happen. Right. Or yes, that's really cool. But this or whatever, right. Like hey. to think of the, yeah, the fallouts of the assumptions that we're making. Yeah. Right. Cause we, we want to create a world. Like we started creating a timeline, right? Like we don't want to just like start a story. We want to have kind of a background involved. So throughout the story, you can reference, Oh, okay, that's why these characters are doing this because this series of events happened over this timeline. Blah 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 blah. Ah, okay, this makes sense, right? And then this is the economics that merged out of that, right? This is how transaction is done, right? This is how what what is of value to people now, and why um, it's very important that this human connection piece and business like comes forward, right? So. These are the kind of parts that we need to like flush out um, so that we can craft a plot that, that makes a lot of sense and, and can be engaging in, in, on a lot of different levels. That That is the dream. That is the epic dream of what we're trying to do here. So super excited you suggested that, Dan. That'd be amazing. Yeah. I mean, because this is, you know, this is part of the research where we're, we, we've, we've approached it from a standpoint of trying to write it in real time. Right, mm -hmm. being very transparent and, and showing the audience what what we're doing, um, and and I and I and I, I have to plug that for you know for the experience of an author. Period, because we all live busy lives, and mm -hmm. wouldn't it be um, very interesting if authorship wasn't a solitary, isolated, uh, you know, type of experience? You know, you're sitting there in your room shaking, and you know, I got to get this out to the world, and that sort of thing, like. What is it about this like neurotic sort of, you know, go do this, go produce it and then bring it out and publish it. And then it's revealed. Right. Sort of thing. So yeah. the iterative model or bringing it out and and building it in, in a in, in a youth social sort of shared type of setting, I think, is is very, very interesting, very intriguing to me. We mm -hmm. call it spaghetti towering. Oh, so, so there's um, there's a study that they did, and it was a spaghetti tower. They got a whole bunch of executives to build a spaghetti tower with raw spaghetti and try to put a marshmallow on top, right? And I think you got some tape. You got 20 minutes to do it, and then they do the exact same thing with like I think a bunch of like seven year olds, right? Mm -hmm. Essentially, and every time the kids will beat the executives. And because the executives take like the first five minutes to decide who's going to be the boss and who's going to be the designer and who's going to be, you know, the person who actually builds, you know, they might create a union. And so then they spend the next five minutes actually doing the design and then they talk about it and then, you know, start to build in the last 10 minutes. And conversely, what the, the children do is they just start building together. And everybody kind of just finds their role and it breaks and they rebuild and it breaks and they rebuild. And they, but they always get further. They can always build a taller tower because they just started and they iterated. And so that's kind of this cool concept with, that we're doing right here is this book is going to be epic because 
we're going to pull the best minds. People are naturally going to fit in and they're going to help us iterate till it's the tallest tower. Oh yeah, that's right. Cool. That's cool. Yeah, that's a really good, that's a really good idea. A great framework, a great architecture for building a model. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right? Well, yeah. We see, we, see this, we see this all the time when in our line of work where like businesses are trying to do stuff or trying to accomplish something, right? You get to 80%, it's like 85% and then, you know, that 80-20 rule, right? That the, all the efforts at the end. And then at some point, you got to say, screw it, do it. Like, we know it's not perfect. <laughs> we'll fix it as we go, right? Um, so, yeah, we're well, you wrote to Kahil and I, whenever we're stuck on something, like, fuck it, spaghetti tower, do it, <laughs> right? We're done talking about it. <laughs> That's fascinating from an engineer because I, I, I've, I've had a lot of experience in architectural construction uh, with engineering uh, mm-hmm. firms. And I noticed there's a distinct difference between working with people that um, are idea people and innovators versus a team of engineers because they want to figure everything out before they do any sort of viable product, right? And, yeah. and you just you just think you there's there's an element of of it being out in the real world that you can't get by analyzing it in the lab. You just can't mm-hmm. you can't do it. You your whole trajectory of of the way and in this case the novel is actually going to form is based off of you know what happens in terms of a feedback or how we do it in sort of like a, uh, like, a, you know, a shared type of building exercise. Right. Yeah. Well, I, you know, when I, I worked at general dynamics for a while, which is a defense contractor and uh, they had a whole group of engineers that were called, I think they called them human systems engineering or whatever. And that was their job was to try and imagine how people would already use it. So for example, um, we build these radio boxes that would then be put into army reconnaissance vehicles. So we brought in people that actually use them, right? Uh, military members. And we say, what do you think of the boxes? How are the knobs? Like, do you like using it? Blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah, it's great, but there's such a pain in the ass. Like why? Like, cause we track everything by serial number and the serial numbers on the back. So for us to go in and like do inventory of all our stuff, we're constantly having to like unhook it, pull it out, check the serial number, put it back. So like a perfect example of a stupid little thing that causes usability to drop considerably. Yeah. Just because how would an engineer it seem like a great place to put it on the back, right? Um, yeah. So. Uh, let me throw the flip side of how this wouldn't work. Hmm. You guys ready? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. On, on, on rocket ship design and O-rings, we don't want to try it out first and then see if that works. Uh, no, don't spaghetti tower that one. Not no. a good idea. Not a good well, idea. So, so for the most like part, we're not risk analysis, right? Like, and yes. I get why engineers are adverse to it. Like, I get it because it's their stamp, it's their ass on the line. You like, be, I would be too. I would be too. I'd be saying, no, I'm going to test this a thousand times before you guys actually do it. Like, there's, I get why they're naturally risk adverse for sure. In our business, when it's process stuff, um, you know, there's not as much risk. So we're able to spaghetti tower it. But taking that mentality, like of an engineer and saying, okay, now you're not designing. This is your business process. You have room to iterate is a hard switch for them because they operate this way every day. So. Well, um, okay. We're, we're getting pulled into the end to consulting world, but I, I do have, I have a question for you about this because in my own <laughs> consulting world, um, I, I quantified risk with Monte Carlo simulations. Did you guys ever get into that type of, uh, you know, quantitative risk analysis? We we went to a, a demo once that was really cool with people that did this, um, you know, where you could take, you could basically simulate anything. But at the end of the day, you still have to assign weightings to like risk levels. You still have to kind of put them in order of what do you think is most important. So even though you can do all this simulation, you're still going to sit in a room and argue over what's in, what's important. So there's still like a human input to it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, well, there, the, the one system that <clears throat> I get your point, but there is one system that I looked at and, and you could actually take the, you know, the Holy grail of the bell curve, right. Mm-hmm. Which, you know, thinkers like Nassim, Nicholas Taleb, you know, goes and hammers everybody because he says, this is just like a false security model. 
um, because history and reality doesn't follow a nice, you know, even distribution, right? So what the idea was is is that you could actually take these 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 different graphs and then model them based off of all these different um, you know risk models, right? Mm -hmm. And then look at these various different outcomes, kind of like this. I don't know what superhero it was, but he, he's able to look at all these probability calculations and predict the future with all a work, you know, a rank and then really? say, Hey, this is, th these are all impossible. This is going to happen. We better do this. Right. So very well, interesting. But yeah. And you can take these models and then you can go look back in history at like financial crashes or natural disasters or things with what, depending on where you're gathering data from and like run your simulation. Did it predict it? No, tweak it, run it again until it predicts it and then try another one and, so you can use the past to predict the future, which I think is super cool. You know, and imagine oh. this world we're, we're creating, if you have this like simulation where it's doing that, it's very predictive. How scary then to take a chance on unplugging and using human connection to drive business instead of this quantified world, right? I, I think that's like another layer we can throw on there, right? This this leap of faith, right? To, to, um, I was just thinking that, oh my gosh, unibrain. Okay. Just <laughs> thinking that exact same thing, right? Adam is like, if, if we can now use AI, right. And it can do all the risk assessment for us and we don't need to actually do it. And it tells you what the best direction to go is, but what it can't do is plug in the people, the emotions, the connections. Then mm -hmm. we've, we, it's a whole nother layer of, of what we're going to go through this transformation, right? I love it. I love that. So let's let's also put that on the docket. This concept of AI and business decision making and risk assessment happening so automated that it's not taking into account uh, the emotional side of things, which mm -hmm. business is a lot of that. Yeah. Okay. So we're we're kind of getting at that point in the show where we've got about twenty minutes, and I'm going to wonder. I'm going to ask you guys if I. This is going to be a part of how we can keep each other on task here. So I'm going to make a suggestion on on how to build a backstory. Okay, okay. Um, not saying that we have to build it, you know, sequentially. That 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 the backstory is actually the first part of the novel, but I think it's an important exercise, whether we cut it later or not. So what I'm imagining is that there's a um, a, a, a present day setting. Okay our reality exactly the way it is so we can you know fill in conversations about pandemic and reality and all these kinds of things so if there's any kind of slant or flavor you want to put on our current exact situation you can do that but what i would say is that there's um so you can reveal as much or as little as you want but the backstory that you're going to work to build is a time capsule um, from a, a generation now that's having a party basically 400 years in the future so, Ooh. right. So, so you yeah. and I, like, say we were doing a capsule today, right? Yeah. Um, and I, the idea came to my mind because on the on the Plank Sip site, we have another um, uh, another fellow who's the uh, owner of SpiralInquiry.org, and I think he's involved with an organization. And I, I don't know sure if I got this right, but the Long Boston Now or or something like this, and they're putting together a time capsule for 400 years in the future. They're literally doing this, right? There's a, this is how they're, uh, you know, engaging. So they're planning the party and all this kind of stuff. Now, they realize, as well as I realize and you realize and Adam realizes that we're not going to be there for that party, right? Mm -hmm. Just, you know, we can plan the party, but we're just not, it's just not really possible that we can actually show up. That is so cool. Yes, absolutely. We'll do this exercise. So if if you can start to think about building a setting, um, you know, developing a character, you know, these become like the original generation of of something. They're the, the seeds and the beginning of, of the novel. And what I find with writers is that they um, they sometimes don't know where to start. And so what I would say is um, you know, try by next week if you can do it. Jot out, um, you know, jot out a, a you know a couple. Uh, I don't know, say like a fifteen hundred words on you know. Start developing some of these characters, right? And so, 
you know, just start trying to develop it because then we're going to, we're, we're going to have that celebration of 400 years and talk about, you know, next week, we're going to talk about, you know, how the rest of the story starts filling in. So the, the characters are the ones having the party or building the Completely capsule? Completely up to you, right? Because it's your guys' novel. I'm just, um, and, and it's, a, it's a writing exercise that that chunk, it, you guys can actually cut it out later. You don't even have to right. say that we're going to use this piece, right? Okay. But in yeah. order to start the conversation and start building in some of the concepts, um, I want you guys to follow what's, what's called a, a pantser uh, type of writing uh, ethos, which means you you guys literally guys are going to sit down in front of a, a laptop or in front of your computer and say, I, I'm not getting up until I've got 500 to 1,000 words, right? And you okay. just sit there and you just write based off of what's going on, you know, currently and about this planned party 400 years in the future. So it's develop some characters. It's a backstory. And we'll compartmentalize it and we'll say, do we want to use this? And these are all sections and chunks that right around the 40 minute mark of each episode, I'm going to say, okay, let's, you know, let's, let's uh, have this assignment. Okay. And I'm not the full director of it. Right. Cause you guys, yeah. you'll catch on to this. Right. And then you'll come back next week and go, I know where I'm going with this. Right. Gotcha. Okay. This makes me think of uh, Isaac Asimov's foundation. Right? Yes. The mathematician predicts the future and then he plans all these reveals at key times in the future history to try and guide humanity one way or the other. <laughs> Super cool. <laughs> See how the prompt, the prompt will allow you to, cause there's no way yeah. I could have, you know, you might take that, do something similar. Kate, Kate's mind might've went in a different direction, right? Just bring the passion already, back, right? right? <laughs> What's that? She's writing it already. <laughs> That's just how it works. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, you know what? and we may have the most disjointed story uh, doing it this way over a period of like I don't know, say sixteen weeks, but or you know, say twenty weeks. But if you guys write fifteen hundred words, um, you know, for uh, say twenty weeks, I mean, guys, that's that's like war and peace, right? So, well, not quite, but half. <laughs> Okay. No, I, I dig it. I think it'll be super fun. And I think well, what you want to do is that you have something that we can sit down with an editor with and say, okay, here's kind of how it's stringing together. And, okay. you know, what do we want to chop and how do we want to, and this, this idea of parsing and chopping, I want to go back to the point where we talked about brain health and we talked about sleeping. Mm -hmm. One of the functions that happens in your sleep is that it, it resets and heals you know, the, 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 the constant stimulus that's going on. So there's some parsing functions that are going on with, with your myelination. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if this is, you know, go through that exercise, really, you know, try and inhabit and live that experience, write that. And at least we can get it, our creativity, you know, thrown in front of us in an objective sort of way to be able to then, you know, keep going back to, um, or, or parsing, eliminating completely. Right. Right. Yeah. No, I, I think it'd be really neat. Like we could write the from the point of view of the planner. So today, me trying to plan a party four hundred years in the future. I have no idea what the world's going to look like. So I'll try and do my best. And then from the point of view of four hundred years in the future, looking like okay, this guy planned a party <laughs> makes no sense in the world we live in now. But how can I integrate it into what I'm trying to do? <laughs> Um, well, you guys are talking to businesses and stuff all the time, right? So mm -hmm. it's a bit of the mentality of planning something interesting. It's like this new wave, new age kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, trying to maybe inhabit a character that is, um, you know, running a business or, you know, the businesses that we see now, you guys come across them all the time. How do I balance this and that and this and that? Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, I got to throw a party for 400 years in the future, you know, like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> right well that's yeah, the dream right guys, well, a actually, oh, yeah you guys get to be actually like the business consultants but like the omniscient business consultants at the top yeah. right like look no, at the angle of it. this person it's here it's the myth of a thousand year company right <laughs> every company wants to live forever but how do you actually do it and so this, this could be a really cool um 
thought experiment about that. That's really interesting. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Let's let's end it. I want to start. <laughs> <laughs> It's fine. You know, we've hit the hour mark and I, you know, yeah. I think you got to know when to call it like a bad relationship, right? You're like, fuck no, it, I'm out of here. Okay, <laughs> cool. We got our homework. We're going to get to work now. I mean, that's, okay, guys. That's what we got to here for it, Ed. So thank you very much. Awesome. Yeah, okay. thank you. Stay epic, guys. <laughs> Always. Always. <laughs>